of Scripture is Isaiah 9, 2 through uh, 2, and then 6 through 9. Let's, uh, let's share God's word together. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land, the dar- darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteous from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The Lord has sent a message against Jacob, and it will fall on Israel. All the people will know it. Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria will say with pride, the arrogant of heart. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I am Pastor Paul Lamb. Um, Again, wonderful to be with you. Um, Okay, where's the choir? (laughs) I was excited to hear the choir this morning bringing some Christmas music or something. I was hoping that would happen. Um, It is good to be in God's house as we come to worship. Um, I I didn't really plan on this, but church, do you, I hope you recognize how special your leadership team is. Um, You've got some good leaders here, and they are working uh, overtime doing all this and trying to organize ministry and prayer groups and Bible studies. And um, I just, I kind of want to lift them up and uh, just tell you how special they are. Encourage them, um, support them, uh, do what you can to help them along in that path as well as they try to uh, develop what God's doing here. This is very, very cool. I'm enjoying it. Okay, you, you lit the second candle uh, today, the Advent candle. It's the candle of peace. Um, they spoke about faith. Um, the candle of peace is also sometimes called the Bethlehem candle. Um, and so my theme today has to do with um, that idea of peace. Um, now, I went to camp a long, long time ago. Oh, Paul, I just moved this. Am I good? A uh, long time ago, and um, we sang a song. Um, you can sort of join me. Some of you older ones will know it. <laughs> I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river. There are a number of songs and hymns that have this idea of peace like a river. Um, It's not like a lake or it's not like an ocean. I mean, there might be passages about that as well. But I'm thinking, what is this peace like a river that the writers are referring to? And scripture um, is used on several occasions. Okay, I have to hold my mouth right, right? (laughs) I did. What am I doing wrong? There we go. There we go. That's all we needed. I needed an electrician. Ah, there we go. Oh, I went backwards. <laughs> okay, we're going to start all over again, okay? Um, for unto us, uh, share this scripture with me. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, he will be called. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, 
everlasting Father, yes, of the greatness of his government and peace. There will be no end. Trying to figure out this peace, trying to figure out what that is, and a river of peace. Um, Revelation speaks of the river that's in heaven in the second time that we, you know, in the, after the second coming of Jesus. What's this, uh, what is this peace that we have? Um, for this is what the Lord says. Say it with me. For this is what the Lord says. I will extend peace to her like a river and the wealth of nations like a flooding stream. This is a passage speaking about Israel. And Jesus promises um, through the prophet Isaiah, God promises through the prophet Isaiah, this peace. And so there it is. It's, it's peace like a river. Um, and, and he even adds to that. No wonder Israel is so wealthy, so rich in, in, in resources and wisdom and technology and medicine and all of that stuff. There are several promises in the Old Testament for Israel that God will bless Israel in a very, very special way. We are to pray for the what? Yeah, the peace of Israel. Um, and so he's giving to us this thought of peace like a river. So what is this peace? Um, you know, if there's one thing that, that probably is universal, um, and, and it, it is everybody wants this, right? In, in all reality, this is what everybody wants. Everybody wants peace. Everybody wants to be a peacemaker. They want to have uh, no, no conflict. Um, they want peace. And I would suggest that um, Scripture, I tried to rifle through and find some passages about peace and what is this peace. And I think there's probably others, but I think there are four main themes that the Bible gives to us about what this peace is. Um, so the first one is it's, it's a peace between people. It's a peace that uh, removes conflict from people. Um, husbands, wouldn't you love that with your wife? I mean, husbands and wives, wouldn't you love that with your, honey, I love our peace. Yes, we have peace. Um, you know, we do. We need peace at home. Uh, we need peace with our children. I crave peace with employers and employees. Um, even in political settings, in work settings, in all kinds of places, we struggle sometimes to have peace. I was speaking with a good buddy a couple days ago. He and his wife went over to Crocker Park and tried to do their Christmas shopping. And I couldn't use the language he used because I'm preaching. <laughs> but he said it was a day like unbelievable. And I said, what happened? He said, oh, man, people were mean. The traffic was horrible. It's getting cut off. And I said, what, what was going on with the people? Ah, people standing in line to go pay their stuff, cut in front of you, and just mean. Church, it's Christmas time. How do we find peace between people? Adam and Eve started the whole thing. They had peace. They had absolute unity with God until something happened and that peace was severed and that peace was broken and they craved peace and it didn't come and so now we have the the leftovers of that we are people of adam and eve we are people that live in a world that is broken that struggles to find peace between people what is this peace a couple of years ago we had uh, a lot of weird stuff going on it was summer of love right that's peace. Okay, here we go. Read it with me. Deuteronomy 20. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. Don't remember seeing that happening a whole lot, but this is the directive God gives any nation that goes against another nation in battle. So it's not that we're going to have no wars. Scripture says there's always going to be wars until Jesus comes again. But Offer peace before you go in and attack a city. And I would say, before you go in and attack your family, before you go in and attack for war of your employer, or whatever the, whatever the 
struggle is, the conflict is between you and another person or people. Offer peace. I love that, that analogy, that text. Okay, here's another one, Psalm 120. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Oh, man. I don't even have to say anything, do I? Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. There is a time for everything and a season of every activity under heaven, a time for war and a time for peace. We are people that crave peace, um, a peace like a river. And, and Billy Graham talks about it being an inner peace. That's what people really crave. They crave an inner peace. Um, so the first thing that I, I see in Scripture is this attitude of peace between people. But there's also in Scripture an attitude of peace that is given between um, people and nature, between man and nature. Um, you know, just, I turned the news on. I shouldn't have done it again this morning. I turned the news on, and did you see the uh, tornadoes that went through Tennessee yesterday? There are people devastated again. Nature is broken. It's going to always be broken. The green movement isn't going to fix it. It's going to be a broken thing, and God promises a peace between man and nature. Here's an example of that. <clears throat> Read with me Mark 4. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that there was already filling. Then Jesus arose, and he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Ah, oh, I want the calm. People in Tennessee want calm right now. Um, we live in a time when you can't necessarily predict the storms and the winds and the snow and the ice and stuff happens. And there's a conflict even with nature that we have to deal with. It's broken. So we have the cravings for peace with uh, people, cravings for peace with our world, our earth. Um, Leviticus 26 says, I will grant peace in the land, and you will lie down with, and you're afraid. I will remove wild beasts from the land, and the sword will not pass through your country. That's from, that's Leviticus naming um, a peaceful state to Israel and to all believers. Leviticus 26. Isaiah 65, and the wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Where's this holy mountain? Jerusalem, yeah. And so he's promising uh, a peace that is even between animals, people and animals. Animals aren't going to bears and Lions aren't going to come and attack you. I will protect you. I will take care of you. The serpent, the, the snakes, um, they will not destroy. Um, we're going to have peace. They're going to feed together. I always love that image of the lion laying down with the lamb. So we want peace between people. We want peace with our world, with our earth. But probably the if, if I were to ask you privately, what kind of peace do you want? This is what we often name. You know, we, we struggle in our lives to have this. How do I know? How'd you do sleeping last night? We struggle, don't we? And I'm telling you, I'm sorry to say the older you get, <laughs> it's, I don't know if it's worrying, I don't know what it is, but there's the test. Your, your brain just can't shut down sometimes. Your heart just can't shut down. It, th there is something going on internally coming from what's happening externally, but there's a struggle. And you know what? We want inner peace. And God says, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a baby, and he's going to be the prince of peace. I want that. I want inner peace. I want to know that, um, you know, my heart condition is going to be dealt with. 
I want to know that my diabetes is going to be, uh, I want to know that my wrist is going to heal. I want to know that um, the tensions, I, I want to know that bills are going to get paid. I want to know the gas prices are going to quit going up. We have all kinds of stuff we stew about. I want to know that my kids are going to be okay. I want to know that they'll even talk to me. I have a very, very good buddy. His children will not talk to him. There was a divorce, and they walked away from dad. We want inner peace, you know. I think that's what the second candle is all about. We crave a peace that helps people to find peace with one another, helps people to find peace in an earth that seems to be constantly churned. And we want inner peace. We want something that, to touch what's happening inside of us. John 14 says, My peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not be afraid. Read the last line again. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. I was always stunned as an active pastor how many of my senior widows were scared to death. They, they were afraid in their own homes. They were hearing things. They could, I'd get calls in the middle of the night. Pastor Paul, come, somebody's outside my house. I think it's an age, I don't know, but we're called not to be afraid. And yet we often live in fear. And God, so God gives this, Jesus gives this peace, but it's a different kind of peace than what the world gives. What kind of peace does the world give? Well, right now we're in the process of buying presents for everybody, and we love doing that. And I've got some nice presents for my wife <laughs> oh man I gotta go get them now I said it's <laughs> shoot no I've got some really nice presents and m my intention is by giving those presents those gifts to my wife and my children and my grandchildren that there's going to be some peace you know things D doesn't things give us peace doesn't stuff you know where I'm going doesn't stuff give us peace? That's what the world wants us to think. You have to have a house. You have to have a car. You have to have a this. You have to have a that. And you get, you know what? The one that you have isn't big enough. You need a bigger one because mine's bigger than yours. And you should go get a new one because it's not as good as mine. So you obviously don't have peace. And somehow we start measuring our peace with some sort of comparison that we do with the world. No wonder it has to do with evil stuff. It's sinful to do that. That's not where peace comes from, obviously. Jesus told us in John 14. Here's Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. And the peace of God, not the peace of the world, not the peace of my parents, not the peace that my spouse has, the peace of God is what is going to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. That's what the church is all about. You folks are people of peace. You are people of God. You are people of Christ Jesus. You know who he is. You, uh, he, he is in your heart. You, you claimed him. You brought him into your heart in a very special way. And so peace should be a part of what you know. I want the world to know about that, and they don't. I wish they, d they did. The fourth thing is probably the biggest thing. And so when Adam and Eve did their thing, it was her. She made me eat the apple. Yeah. Oh, she did. She's evil. And what ends up happening? There's a breakdown between God and man, not just between God and woman, or man and woman, 
but between God and man. And God sends them out and says, man, you're going to work like you've never worked before. Woman, you're going to have child and pain in your child birthing, baby birthing, whatever. And it's going to always be a reminder of the brokenness between us. God sets that up. So you guys, you've been working hard, plowing those fields. It's a reminder constantly. We have to do it every year. We have to replow the fields every year. As a reminder, we have to we have to continually work every year. It's a reminder that things are not right between us and God. There's brokenness. There's sin that's crept in. There's there's stuff that's come between us and God. And man, I gotta do something to fix that. I gotta I gotta plow the field better to fix that. And what's the answer? I can't fix it. You can't fix it. Peace between God and man can't be fixed by man. Right? You guys know this. Peace between God and man cannot be fixed by man. For he, uh, Ephesians 2, for he himself is our peace. He came and were afar (coughs) away and peace to those who were near. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who are near. So he is our peace. Our, our peace isn't in getting the bills paid or being good stewards of our tithes or making sure this church happens a certain way. It's something different. Peace is coming from some different place, and it's Jesus. It's coming from the baby. That's why we celebrate um, Christmas and we celebrate Advent and the anticipation of that coming. And my prayer is that you have Jesus in your heart, that Christmas just isn't rote for you. Well, I got to go buy my present, and I do have presents, by the way. I, I got to go buy my presents. It's, oh, wait, look, it's Chris, almost Christmas time. I got to go do what I got to go do. Man, to have a peace is so much more important and significant and um, life holding than that, especially when life is so broken and hard. How many of you know people that are living alone? They've lost their spouse. They've lost whatever. They're living alone. Um, I've got a new, I've got a, a friend who contacted me a little while ago. His wife wanted him gone. 80 year old guy has to move out, get his own place. So he did. Annulment happened. They just signed papers. It was easier to get the divorce than to do the marriage. So he's out on his own. And I'm thinking, man, this poor guy, 80 years old, he's by himself. Didn't expect that this year, did he? But a month ago that happened. And now where is he going to find his peace? It doesn't come from finding a companion. You think it does. It doesn't. It doesn't come from your children doing whatever they're going to do. It comes from a different place. He himself is our peace. Jesus is our peace. John 16. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this you will, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I love all the scripture. I just, I love the word of God. I hope you love the word of God. The answers to the brokenness of the world is right there in scripture. And if you will open your eyes to that, close your eyes to the worldly, let God teach you where that peace comes from, you'll be a person of peacefulness, of a peaceful heart. And when when struggles come, you'll know how to have peace in those struggles, even in those rough times. The Apostle Paul was one of my favorite examples of that. The man rotted in a prison cell, and he literally wrote, I have learned to be content in all things. Are you kidding me, Paul? You've learned to be content in all things. You're rotting in a prison cell, and in that same letter, he's writing his church and asking them to bring blankets because he's so cold. Man, he has peace because his peace comes in here it's something that's internal so I think as we look through these scriptures it's 
pretty apparent that the Bible tells us that we live in a broken place. And in order to have peace, God wants us to have peace with people, gives us instructions of how to do that. He wants us to have peace with the earth. I love the idea of Jesus, uh, not the idea, I love what Jesus did. He stood up in the boat and he said, what's wrong with you people? Are you, you disciples? Where's your faith? Stop. And the wind stopped. He controlled the wind. God controls the wind. He controls the tragedies. He controls all that stuff that's happening. And if it still comes through and, and, and hits and crashes and destroys, God gives you the strength to keep going and do the next thing he wants you to do amazing and he gives us inner peace inner peace is a soul peace it's knowing that your body may be breaking it may be dying it may be withering away God doesn't want your body right he wants this he wants your soul your body is going to go to the ground what you are the wisdom that you are the emotion that you are the uh, attitude that I don't know if it's attitude the the makeup of who you are, the God-likeness, I am like God, that God-likeness, that's what he wants. That's going to live for all of eternity. Oh, it's so, so awesome. And finally, the, the damage between us and God, it's fixed. If you claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you take Jesus' peace into your heart, if you claim Jesus as the giver of that peace, so, church, do you claim Jesus is the giver of the peace? This is a Billy Graham quote. To have peace, we must possess the peace giver. When I ran across that, I had to add that to my thing today. I just thought that was very profound. Um, it's very simple, but it's really profound. To have peace, you're not going to find it by, you know, all the worldly ways, all the problems, the struggles, the tensions of the world. You're going to have to possess the peace giver. So if you are at odds with God, find a way to get on your knees. Find a way to speak with him about giving you peace. Because there will be no peace that you can bring. It is only peace that God can bring. Amen? Amen. Amen.